The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Stranger in the house. Helen decided she might as well be honest with herself. The suspense was getting her down. But if she didn't find out one way or the other pretty soon, something was going to snap. It had been over six years since her foster brother Ted had left for the Orient on that government mission. And he was still out there, somewhere between Manila and Shanghai, alive or dead. It was a terrible thing to admit even to herself. But she was even wishing now for any kind of message. Even one stating Ted was dead. At least it would end the waiting. At least it would be better than not knowing at all. George, please. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Ted's been on my mind for so long now that I wish I could forget about him for a while. I'm rather surprised to hear you say that, Helen. Oh, I know. It sounds terrible. But, George, it's been six, almost seven years of waiting and not knowing. Yes, I know, Helen. I can't stand it much longer, George. After all, he's my foster brother. Don't you understand? All these years of... Silence. If if they'd only tell us something. You must realize there are a lot of women like you, dear. It's just one of the terrible things about the aftermath of war, that's all. Let's just wait, then. Let's not talk about him anymore. I'm your lawyer, Helen. There are some things we've got to talk about. All right. Go on, George. Well, it's been almost seven years now. If we haven't heard from Ted in another four months, he'll be declared legally dead. What does that mean? There's a clause in your foster father's will, Helen. When Ted dies, the entire estate goes over to you. Why must you always throw that will in my face, George? Why must it always come around to money, money, money? Every time we talk about Ted, it's the same thing. I don't care about the money. All I care about is having him back alive and well. Now, please go, George. If it doesn't have to be settled till September, let's not talk about it till then. All right, Helen. Well, George. Here. I'm sorry I blew up. I... I guess I'm just not myself. Sure, Helen. I understand. Yes, Helen, the suspense is beginning to tell on you, isn't it? Almost seven years of it. Just a few letters from Ted early in 1941 telling you of his arrival in Manila. Then silence. No way you could get in touch with him. Nothing you could do but wait. And you're still waiting, rushing out to meet the postman, hoping each day will be the big one. George is more tactful now about the will. He doesn't mention it anymore, and you're very grateful. And then at long last, the suspense has ended. It's not the postman. It's Rhoda, your maid, walking into your bedroom one morning with a cablegram. When did it come, Rhoda? Just this minute, miss. A messenger brought it to the door. Arriving June 4th, Seattle steamer President Jefferson. Love, Ted. Oh, at last. Oh, Miss Helen, Mr. Ted coming home at last. Yes. Yes, Rhoda. At last. Pardon me? Oh, 
I beg your pardon. Pardon? Stuart? Oh, Stuart. Uh, Yes, miss? I'm looking for Mr. Ted Van Norton. Where is his cabin, please? Just a minute, please. Uh, Van Norton. Uh, Stateroom 3C, third deck. Thank you. Come in. Ted, darling. Hello. Uh, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I must have the wrong stateroom. I'm looking for my brother, Ted Van Norton. What's the matter, Helen? Don't you recognize me? What? Who are you? Well, this isn't much of a homecoming after six years. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe I'd better introduce myself. The name is Theodore Van Norton. Oh, there, there must be some mistake. Helen, darling, you're joking. Who are you? Well, I've already told you. I'm your foster brother, Ted Van Norton. You're not, Ted. You're... You're an imposter. <laughs> With the prologue of Stranger in the House, the Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, important news for drivers. The amazing new type tire by Lee of Conshohocken, which is being announced this month in the Saturday Evening Post, is already at your Signal dealers. I'm referring to the new 8-rib Super Deluxe Lee tire. Not just a new model, mind you, but a completely new tire you can see that the handsome eight-rib tread is wider and flatter, and there's more rubber in it. But not until you drive on these new type tires can you appreciate their easier turning and steering and the way they absorb road shocks, sparing you fatigue and sparing your car unnecessary wear. In addition, quicker stopping and greater protection against skidding are assured by the 16 cleaning edges on Lee's broad, flat tread. And when it comes to wear... These new Lee Super Deluxe tires are setting records so amazing they're almost unbelievable. Yet all this extra quality is yours at no extra cost. In fact, right now, as their summer driving special, signal dealers are offering extra generous trade-ins on old tires, plus liberal credit terms. So before you buy any tire, see your signal dealer. Find out how little it will cost you to enjoy real safety and comfort this summer with new 8-Rib Lee Super Deluxe Tires. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Helen, all you can do is stand there in the stateroom and stare at him. The effrontery of this stranger trying to pass himself off as your foster brother leaves you at a loss for something to say. True, he does resemble Ted. He's tall. The same build, the same athletic poise, the same general features. But the expression, it's not quite Ted's, is it? That's funny, isn't it, Helen? Perhaps he thinks it's funny in a different sort of way. Perhaps he's one of those people with a perverted sense of humor, a practical joker. Yes. It's hilarious, isn't it, to pull a trick like this after all those years of almost unbearable suspense. Well, darling, hadn't we better get a move on? Are you stupid enough to think you can get away with this? Uh, get away with what? If this is some crude attempt at humor, I Not don't... Not at all. I'm quite serious. Where's Ted? Oh, do you have to be that way? I explained once. Don't lie to me. Where is he? Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> oh, Stuart. Uh, Yes, Mr. Van Orton. Would you take care of my hand baggage, please? Yes, sir, right away. Thanks. Come on, Helen, let's go down to the dock. I'll call the purser. Wait a minute, now look. See, passport with fingerprints and photograph, birth certificate, State Department credentials, letters from you. They are forgeries. I'm sorry, they're genuine. You, you're not going home with me. I won't stand for it. Very well, darling. I'll check in at a hotel for the time being. But after all, you can't keep a guy out of his own home. Can you? George? George, I've never been so stunned in my life. He just stood there smiling at me, saying over and over that he was Ted. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, You say he had identification? Everything. Even letters from me. I wrote them when Ted first arrived in Manila. Were they genuine? Oh, I think so. You're my lawyer. Do something. Oh, he'd know better than try to get by with forgeries. Helen, you're... You're sure you're right? 
George, you don't think I know my own brother? Oh, but it's been close to seven years. He's probably been in prison camp. That can make a lot of difference in a man's appearance. But it's not entirely a matter of appearance. It's the way he walks, his voice, his mannerisms. Besides, Ted's dead. What? Well, something terrible's happened, I'm sure of it. This man might have killed him. Yes, that's it. So he could get his hands on Ted's money. That's a pretty serious charge, Helen. You've got to be sure of yourself. You're the only one in Seattle who can recognize him. And remember, he's been gone for seven years. Do you have any pictures? No, I thought of that. No. Hmm. No, there weren't any, not since he was a little boy. Spent most of his time in the East with Aunt Ida. Well, where is she? She died some time ago. Well, there are a lot of ways we can check on him. The State Department ought to know about him. He's been with them for over ten years. You, uh, you say he's stopping at a hotel? Yes, you know, of course, that if he can prove his identity, he has a legal right to live here in this house. I tell you, he's a flagrant imposter. He's not coming here if I have to hire somebody to throw him out. Oh. Who is it? It's Rhoda, miss. Oh, what time is it? After eight. Oh, go away. I'm sleepy. I must see you, miss. All right, Rhoda, come in. Now, what is it? It's... it's that man, Mr. Van Norton. What? Where is he? He's in the guest bathroom, miss. Shaving. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer... Well, good morning. What, what do you think you're doing? Shaving. Morning ablutions. <laughs> Can't say I'm used to having ladies barge into the bathroom. Get out of here. Ah, 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 ah. Temper. How temper. did you get in? Well, I couldn't get a room at a hotel, so I took a taxi up last night. Walked in the back door. It was open, you see. You can leave the same way you came in. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm here to stay, sister dear. I've got the proof in my pocket. And if you want to get me out, you can trot right down to the Hall of Justice and get yourself a court order. Have some more coffee, Helen. No, thanks. Hot cakes? Mr. Whoever you are. Van Norton. Name's Theodore Van Norton. I must say, I've never seen such colossal nerve in my life. Oh, you flatter me. You're not at all concerned about the servants? Hmm? Should I be? Aren't you afraid they'll fail to recognize you? Don't be silly. None of them were here when I left. Edward the butler was last to go, I think. Oh, by the way, Helen, whatever became of old Edward? There are other people in town, of course. What about your teachers at Washington Heights School? <laughs> Why, Helen, <laughs> I believe you're trying to trick me. You know, Father sent me to Fox Hall Academy when I was 14. I never went to Washington Heights. Oh. Where are you going? You seem to know everything. Why don't you tell me that? Uh, Helen, we have some talking to do, darling, about the will. Father's estate left all of it to me, you know. Seems to me the executor owes me close to a million dollars. You knew it was coming, didn't you, Helen? That's the purpose behind this whole crazy business. It's still inconceivable to you that the man can actually expect to get away with it. George was right. There are a thousand ways you can check up on him. And the imposter himself just gave you an excellent one. You make a long-distance call to the Fox Hall Academy and talk to Mr. Rigby, the headmaster. Why, yes, of course, Miss Van Norton. I'd be delighted to come down tomorrow afternoon. Ted was always one of my favorites, you know. Uh, any special time. What about two o'clock? Fine, fine. It'll be quite a reunion, won't it? Yes, indeed, Mr. Rigby. Quite a reunion. <laughs> Mr. Rigby, this is George Chadwick, my lawyer. Mr. Chadwick. How do you do, sir? Would you like to wait in the living room, Mr. Rigby? I think Ted's out on the tennis court. We'll call him. Thanks. Come on, George. Excuse us, Mr. Rigby. Of course. You still think I don't know my brother? No, I never said that, Helen. I only said seven years can make a lot of difference. You yourself said his general features were the same. <laughs> I'm afraid Mr. What's-his-name 
going to suffer a little embarrassment. You think Rigby will recognize him? We'll recognize him as an imposter, if that's what you mean. Hmm. He knows Ted as well as I do. Uh-huh. What's the matter? I don't know. I had those documents checked, the hospital records in Manila. He was a patient there for... I'll a... tell you, he's a fraud. Heaven knows what's happened to Ted or how this crook got hold of his papers, all but right, he's... All right, all right, Helen. You'd better go and call him. Hello, sis. What's up? I was sorry to interrupt your tennis game, Ted. Oh. Oh, it's Ted now, huh? Why, of course. I could have been mistaken, you know. Well, can't say I expected this. I'd be a little foolish not to admit it when I'm wrong, wouldn't I? Come on, dear. Where to? Just to the living room. You can go back to your tennis in a moment. Oh, there you are, George. Hello, Ted. Hello, George. What's going on around here? We're going into the living room, George. Perhaps you'd like to join us. Yes, of course. Well, open the door, George. Hmm? Oh, oh, sorry. Say, what's this all about? I... Rigby! Ted! Teddy, old boy, how have you been? Oh, you old son of a... Gu- <laughs> what is this, Helen, a surprise? Why don't they tip a guy off when his old headmaster comes to see him? Oh, you're looking <laughs> fine, Teddy. Yeah. Good Lord, it's been a long time. Yeah. Last time I saw you was after the Washburn game, remember? Was- yeah, at Spokane. Yeah. Stinky was there, too. <laughs> Say, do you remember the bus broke down that night outside of Wenatchee? Oh, yeah. You and I had a history. You stand there stunned, speechless just staring at them as they slap each other in the back, forgetting all about you. And George avoids looking at you. He's on their side now, you're sure of it. And worst of all, it's beginning to get you too. He's not Ted, your foster brother. You know it, you're positive. It's ridiculous to go through all this rigmarole, but it seems to be your word against his proof, doesn't it? But there are still other ways, aren't there? Like another long-distance call. This time to the State Department in Washington, D.C. After being transferred to four or five different offices, you finally get through to the right man. It's most important that you check this matter thoroughly. I'm positive that the man representing himself as my foster brother is an imposter. You say you were with Mr. Van Norton when he filed his original application here in 1938? Yes. I saw him attach his photograph and fix his fingerprints. I simply want to see that application. I'll forward the file to our Seattle representative... You can check it there. Will that be satisfactory? Quite satisfactory, thank you. Uh, I see. You say the file was forwarded here from Washington. That's right. I simply want to examine it, particularly the photograph. Uh Uh-huh. Excuse me a moment, Miss Van Norton. I'll have to look it up. Well, George. Well, what? I can't say that I'm pleased with your lack of faith in me. No, who said anything about that? Oh, it's clear enough. Look, I'm a lawyer. I'll believe black is white if they throw enough evidence at me. Mr. Rigby was a very convincing witness. He's a decrepit old fool, and it had been 15 years. I thought he was an intelligent man. I could have passed you off as my brother. He'd forgotten what Ted looks like. I don't know. You might be arguing against yourself. What do you mean? You haven't seen Ted in almost seven years. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Here we are. Theodore H. Van Norton. Uh, Now, what did you wish to see? Here, let me see it. Uh, Medical examination, education record, application. Where's the picture? On the other side. Oh, here. Satisfied, Helen? It it can't be. I saw Ted paste the picture on himself. Is something wrong? Of course there's something wrong. This isn't Ted's picture. It's it's that man. Helen, Helen, get hold of yourself. Here, let me see. Yes, here they are, fingerprints. Now, listen. Listen, clerk. I want this whole record sent to the office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Helen, you've got to have a rest. This thing is getting That's you. That's one thing. It can't be forged, don't you see? They can't forge his fingerprints. Well, I'm sorry, Miss Van Norton, but I have no authority you've to You've got send... to. I tell you, there's a stranger in my house. He's posing as my foster brother. There's a million dollars involved. Just a minute, Helen, please. It's, uh, it's most important, Mr. Robbins, not only because of the money involved... Mrs. Van Norton is uh, extremely upset. Well, of course, Mr. Chadwick, but you see, I can't simply turn over material oh. like this to I'll the... make the necessary arrangements with the FBI, Mr. Robbins, and get your authority from Washington. Will that be satisfactory? Oh, quite, Mr. Chadwick, quite. Hello, Ted. Well, Helen, I began to wonder where you were all afternoon. Oh, downtown shopping. Stores are frightful these days. Yeah, indeed they are. You reading? Hmm? Yeah. How's Dick Tracy? 
No, oh, haven't checked him today. It's funny. You used to read Dick Tracy before you even looked at the headlines. I guess a guy gets a little serious after all those years overseas. Prison camp, hospital. Yes, I suppose so. You're looking calmer today. Finally decide on the real thing? I... I want you to forgive me, Ted. It's so unbelievable that I... I don't quite trust my senses anymore. Sure. You're a good kid, Helen. I don't blame you. Will you drink on it? Why not? What'll it be? Bourbon and soda. Oh, you're a man after my own heart. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I thought you'd be a tougher nut to crack. Oh? You expected me to be suspicious? Well, after that episode on the boat, I expected anything. Oh. Here you are. Thanks. What do we drink to? To us, of course. All right. To us. Yes, ma'am? You're in charge of the fingerprinting department here? Yes. I'm Helen Van Norton. I brought in a highball glass yesterday afternoon with some fingerprints on it. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, That's the one you wanted us to check against the prints on the State Department application file. That's right. Um, where did you get that glass? A man is posing as my brother, staying at my house. They're his fingerprints. You're sure of the prints on the application? What do you mean? Are you sure they're the bona fide prints of your brother? Of course. I was with him in Washington when he completed the application in 1938. I saw him put the prints on it. I see. Well, that ought to settle it once and for all. What do you mean? The man at your house is your brother, Miss Van Norton. The prints are identical. I... Why, I... It can't be. It can't. We wouldn't commit ourselves if we weren't positive. I... I see. Of course. Oh, thank you. Well, Helen, that settles it, doesn't it? You're beaten and you know it. And worst of all, you're not at all sure of yourself anymore. Yes, that's the unbearable part. Not knowing in your mind whether you're right or wrong. But you still have one more out, just one. It's a long chance, but you've decided you have to take it. To decide once and for all whether or not this man, Ted, is your foster brother. Whether you can trust your own mind. It's very late that night when you get quietly out of bed and walk downstairs to the telephone. The house is as quiet as a tomb. Everyone's asleep. Long distance. I want to call Shanghai operator. Mr. C.S. Julian, 28 Perlang Drive, Shanghai. Just a moment. Yes. Y- yes, I'll wait. Here's your party. Go ahead, please. H- Hello. Hello. Is this Mr. Julian? Who is calling, please? I last talked to you in April 1941. The name I gave you was Grayson. Do you remember that? Do you remember me? Of course I remember you. You called concerning a man, a Mr. Van Norton, as I remember. He was in Manila. Do you know what became of him? He was killed in an accident in May of 1941. You're... you're positive? Positive. Thank you, Mr. Julian. Thank you very much. Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word of wisdom to Mr. Average Driver. You spend well over $100 a year for gasoline. That's a lot of money. You'd like to be sure it's buying the gasoline that's tops in quality, the gasoline that gives you top performance from your car. 
Well, you can be sure if you'll just keep two points in mind when you buy gasoline. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, signal is the famous go farther gasoline. After all, the only way any gasoline can put more thrilling performance into your car is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you get better mileage. So there you have it in a nutshell. The reason why Signal's good mileage is so important to you. And the reason Signal says to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality. There are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. It was a relief to know, wasn't it, Helen? You can trust your own senses now. Ted is dead. Mr. Julian just told you so. And the stranger in the house is an imposter. Somehow, somewhere, you can prove it. But right now, you don't want to think about it anymore. It's been too bewildering. All you want now is your bed and the first good night's sleep in a week. You put down the phone and start toward the stairs. Sit down, Helen. How long have you been here? Long enough. I said sit down. I'm going upstairs. Sit down before you fall down. That's it. You just hung yourself, baby. There's a record of that phone conversation down at FBI headquarters. What are you talking about? You didn't have Shanghai, in case you're wondering. You were talking to the boys down at the office. Not Mr. Julian. We had everything, you see, except the link you just gave us. We knew Mr. Julian paid $10,000, part of the money you sent him. It's one of his boys in Manila. The boy who killed your foster brother, Ted. But... I was the only one who knew. I was detained over there in a prison camp, like I said. It was a long wait. I knew Ted had a foster sister, and I knew there was close to a million bucks in it somewhere. But all I had was a suspicion. What about Julian? The authorities in Shanghai have him. Well, I guess there's nothing much I can do. Tough, isn't it? You could have been a nice kid. You weren't a killer at heart. You shouldn't have picked out someone in the State Department. Oh, it took us a long time to work it out. A lot of names, a lot of people. We even drew on the services of Mr. Rigby. But when we got going, we knew you'd crack sooner or later. Who are you? This time, baby, I'm telling you the truth. I was your brother's best friend. My name's McKay. Oh, and incidentally, I'm with the FBI. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Virginia Gregg and Gerald Moore. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Harold Swanton and Mark Smith, and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Next Wednesday, for a full hour of mystery over most of these stations, tune in a half hour earlier. Enjoy The Saint, as well as The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week the Columbia Broadcasting Systems.